Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on the show with us returning guest, Mark Hadley. Mark, welcome. Thanks for having me. Mark, you are the author of Blown for Good, one of the best-selling books out there on the Church of Scientology, and you worked for many years at Golden Era Studios. That's correct. Fifteen years I worked there. And so that's why I wanted to have you on this special edition. We're going to do today's show is about Scientology, technology, and the Internet. Oh, perfect. And Mark, where do we even start? Well, I think a really good example of how Scientology does or doesn't keep up with technology is on their materials. That's a great example of how they they sort of um, promote and how they sell uh, products to the to their members. And correct. L. Ron Hubbard, in I guess starting in the fifties. Um, he delivered lectures to usually small crowds of people, and he recorded them on reel-to-reel uh, audio tapes. And you, you know, you had these big plastic reels, and one would feed the tape, and the other one would spool up the tape. And uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a, a reel-to-reel machine in, <laughs> in somebody's home today. But um, so he recorded his lectures on reel to reels, and then all they would do is they would just copy those. They would take those reels and then hook that a playback machine up to a recording machine, and then they'd copy it. And then that's pretty much how Scientologist uh, Scientologists around the world listened to L. Ron Hubbard's lectures. And that's what they had in all the course rooms and the Scientology uh, organizations all over the world. Um, those reel-to-reels um, were sort of mass-produced, and the more they copied them, the worse and worse and worse and worse the copies got, to almost to the point where you could barely understand what he was saying on some of these reel-to-reels because there were so many iterations down the line um, from the original master. Okay, I think after cassettes came out and were sort of the preferred medium, they kept using reel-to-reels. I know in, I want to say in 1989 at in Florida, um, when I was doing Scientology training there, when I was a kid, I was listening to L. Ron Hubbard lectures on reel-to-reel tapes. And this is in the late 80s. This is amazing to me because I, I remember cassette tapes from the early 70s. I remember I bought a Craig Art cassette deck for my car. Mm -hmm. And everyone oohed and awe because it was out of 8-track. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it looks like the Church of Scientology missed the 8-track revolution of the 60s. <laughs> yeah, well, and waited. <laughs> why did they wait so long to adopt cassette tape? Was it due to the large installed base of reel-to-reel -reel machines? Well, we had what was called the Ampex battery at Golden Era Productions. And the Ampex battery was, I think it was, I wanna say four or six machines. So there was a master machine and then there was a bunch of slave machines and that's what reel-to-reels were copied on. And they were using those to make cassettes all, or to make these reel-to-reels all the way into the 80s. Now, the compact cassette format came out in the early 1960s. That's when it actually came out. I'm sure probably by the late 60s, um, you know, they were still doing it and it was the quality wasn't good, but I'd say by the early 70s, cassettes were starting to gain traction and then, you know, they pretty much became the preferred medium across audio. It was basically like a kind of a shootout between eight track and cassettes and cassettes won out in that war. True, and I, re I remember that from way back, and uh, the cassette uh, reached a price point where consumers could afford it, and I remember the early generation, you know, you'd often give people a gift of a, a cassette tape recorder, and it was a miraculous thing. Yeah. But then people were going into Scientology organizations listening to reel to reel. That's right. So, that, so reel to reels pretty much were the preferred method of audio lectures I'd say until the late 80s for Scientology. And then there was a very few lecture series that were released on cassettes. Okay, so let's just say they're 10 to 15 years behind in adapting to some sort of 
audio recording method. We then were making cassettes at the uh, Int Base when I arrived in 1990, and we had a mass, two master machines, and we had 16 slave machines that would record lectures at high speed. I think it was 32 times um, regular speed, real time. And you could record on a pancake of tape. It was like a, a, a giant reel of cassette tape. And you could record around 30 one hour lectures on one pancake. And we had 16 pancakes that would be recorded um, every hour. 480. Yeah, which it varied because some lectures were 45 minutes aside and some lectures were an hour aside. So if we had a lecture that was short, it was good for us because our stat was number of lectures produced, number of cassettes produced. So we could get more done in less time if it was a short lecture or if we were making a music cassette because sometimes the music cassettes would just be a single. So it would be a five minute cassette. And so you could cram in, you know, whatever that is, six times you could do on one um, pancake, you could have 150 music cassettes. If we were doing a music cassette, that was gonna be awesome. That means we were gonna have good, good statistics for the week if we were cr cranking out a lot of music singles. But um, so did that mean that Congresses were a nightmare? Oh, yeah, no, the longer, the, the biggest problem was that right before I had gotten there, they had produced, I think it was 300,000 cassettes that were of horrible quality. A cassette cost about a dollar to make because mainly because of the type of tape they were using. So they were re re using a, uh, a cassette shell and a shell cost about a nickel. And the tape inside the shell was metal, TDK metal tape, and that cost about a dollar. So 300,000 cassettes, that's about $300,000. So when I got there, all of the people that worked in that area had been, all except for one, had either been declared or declared a suppressive person or sent to the rehabilitation project force. And there was only one girl who was left that worked there, that stayed, and she was Clarice Brousseau, Clarice Barnett. Sh she was Shelley Miscavige's sister. And I think that's the only reason that she was saved. And she got demoted from lieutenant junior grade to like CPO or something, uh, chief petty officer. Anyway, regardless of all that, in the 1990s, we're still making cassettes. Okay, the CD's now been out for almost 10 years. Um, pretty much CD players and CDs were commercial, commercially available in the early 1980s. I remember when I was a kid, I had CDs. So I know that in 1990, people had CDs. But Golden Era Productions wasn't producing anything on CD for the most part. Every once in a while, they might put out a special edition of a music thing or something on a CD. But for the most part, no, we weren't mass producing any CDs there at the property. When I left in the early 2000s, we had just in the past ye few years started producing CDs at Golden Era Productions. So almost 20 or yeah, 20 years after CDs had gained traction and were commercially available, Golden Era was now producing lectures on CDs. <laughs> okay. This is in the early 2000s, which of course leads to the early 2000s. <laughs> People are downloading music and and music is in a digital format and people aren't using CDs so much and cars are starting to be made that don't have CD players in them and people are more and more listening to iPods and uh, you know digital music devices. Something has to cause a change in the church from say the cassette tape to the CD. Is it a long and painful process they don't want to make? Yeah, it's basically, and here's the, this is the craziest part. When I was there, we had specific amounts of lecture series um, that we were supposed to produce. So if we're gonna make a new lecture series, I would, from what I remember, for the most part, 
if we were going to sell at an international release, we were going to sell a new lecture series, we would produce 1,500 copies. Why 1,500 and not 2,000 or some because other Because that was about the amount that they could sell. Really? 1,500. Which also says something about the membership numbers they throw around. If you have 27 million <laughs> followers and you're coming out with the got to have most hottest new release and you can't sell out 1500 well there you go well that's an interesting very hard data point we'll come back to later yeah so regardless of that when you when they would produce these a lot of times they'd sell 200 sets so now you've got 1300 sets sitting in stock and that will dwindle down slowly 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 and certain amount of the organizations get a few copies so they can display them and everyone's supposed to have a minimum amount but for the most part this 1500 amount a little bit of that gets sold and then the rest are just stuck everywhere okay well we were producing 50,000 cassettes a week for a long period and that was sort of the arbitrary figure that david miscavige had worked out that this production line should be able to produce on a weekly basis. And that was sort of the, the goal. And in, in, in another interview, I talked about this flood that we had at the international base. And the, the, the entire base was assigned a condition of confusion. Correct. Well, for months and months and months, we had strived to get the this cassette copying line up to a point where it could produce 50,000 cassettes a week and we could never hit 50,000 for months starting in August all the way to November it was a weekly struggle some weeks we'd do 40,000 some weeks we'd do 2,000 some weeks we'd do uh, you know 18,000 and it was always up and down and there would be problems with the machines and we found out that the temperatures changed the tuning of the, the calibration of the machines and we went through everything and anything to get these these high speed cassette duplication machines to just crank out recordings that were all good that could be packaged and it would add up to this 50,000 50, figure. On, th the, on Thanksgiving of 1990, that week it was a Thursday, so and that's the end of the week, the, 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 the statistic reporting week in Scientology. That Thursday, we hit 50,000. We, we got over 50,000 in a week. And that coincidentally was the week that the entire property was allowed and upgraded from these lower conditions that we started at confusion and had to work our way up. That was the day that we were upgraded from lower conditions, the week that we hit 50,000 cassettes. And that was, that was pretty much what was attributed to why we were allowed to get out because the cassette copy line, which had, this had been a, a subject of Dave's intensity for years to get this thing to make all these cassettes. Okay, well, this is the part you got to understand. We're cranking out, we're trying to crank out 50,000 every week. When we actually ended up hitting 50,000, for many weeks after that, we continually produced 50,000 a week. They weren't selling 50,000 a week. So we were basically stockpiling cassettes everywhere and anywhere so that we could hit our 50,000 figure. But the salespeople, weren't se they weren't selling 5,000 cassettes a week. So what happens to all that? Does it, it just this piles is, up? This is why Scientology doesn't switch over. Because now, if we switch over, if, if we've produced 50,000 cassettes a week for two years, we're talking about millions of cassettes that have now been produced at a dollar a piece. So now... We can't switch over until you sell those down. And now, <laughs> and now here's what happens. You've got to sell these things as much as you can. You've got to shove them down people's throats. Everybody who needs them bought them. There's no one to sell them to. And now if we say we're going to switch over to compact discs, 
you're talking about burning millions of dollars worth of stock. And you don't only have the cassettes. The cassettes are labeled, and they're labeled, and they're inside of a plastic binder, which has a cover and a back cover and a spine and a transcript of three, you know, a several hundred page transcript. And it has shrink wrap and it's in the box and it's in, you know, you're talking to, you're just adding up all these figures and you're basically talking about just throwing this stuff away. Millions of dollars that we've been producing over the years that no one's selling. So I think this has to do with why it takes them so long. And then also they sell all these people, all of these, these tapes. And then once they're all sold, then they go, okay. Or once an, as many as they can sell are sold. And they say, okay, that's it. We're done. We're jumping to CD. And then you come out and you say, okay, we just released all these things on CD. You just been browbeating these people to buy these cassettes forever. And they haven't even opened the shrink wrap on the cassettes. And now you're saying, well, we just came out with these things on CD. Like you can't, you can't listen to it on cassette. <laughs> but Mark, let me, let, let's set the scene for our listeners. Okay. The Church of Scientology is, is stuck with millions of cassette tapes. It's the early 1990s and something called the BBS or the internet is beginning to emerge. Yes. And they're worried, they're choking on cassettes that they need to sell to people who are buying CDs. Yeah. The internet, they don't even see it coming. No, no. I mean, is, is their attention focused elsewhere on cassette sales? Well, no, I, I, I don't even think... The internet is a the internet is an odd beast because L. Ron Hubbard wrote about cassettes. L. Ron Hubbard wrote about reel to reels. Um, L. Ron Hubbard wrote about f uh, faxes and copy machines. There's actually an LRH policy that says if you have to make more than ten copies of something, you need to use a, a, a Mimeo machine. I mean, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can't you can't <laughs> be copying more than ten copies on a copy machine. You got to go. That needs to go to Mimeo. You got to shoot a plate and you know get that all through. <laughs> it's too expensive to use a copy machine. <laughs> but the internet was never written about. I don't. You, I think you're exactly right. I don't think they ever saw the internet. I don't think they ever thought about the internet. My first recollection of the internet at the int base was Warren McShane, who was the, he was sort of like the legal, I think he was, his post was the legal affairs director of RTC. And he got up in front of the int base. It was, I think it was early, I want to say early 1995. And he played a video for us of him and a whole bunch of police raiding a guy's house who was an SP. And I think his name was uh, Dennis Ehrlich and we yes. watched this video of Warren going through this guy's house and going through his discs and going through his closet and digging through I remember that and this is going to be this this will make sense a little later when I'm talking to you about the, the internet and stuff like that but Warren was Warren was basically narrating the video. We couldn't hear the sound of what was going on. I don't think Naren was just uh, Warren was just narrating it as it was playing. But he was like, "Oh, and then we found these pornographic video cassettes in his closet, and and it, you know, there's like a few VHS tapes or something in there." It's like, um, okay, um, and it was very salacious though. Oh my God, this SP had pornographic video cassette recordings, and. Um, so, but we're, so we're going, we're watching this video, but this evidently, this individual was sharing squirrel materials or posting Scientology things on online and somehow they were sharing them or there was this, some sort of bulletin board where they were posting things. And, yeah. And this was ARS. Okay. Well, if you say yeah. so, I mean, yeah. I, I w this was, this was literally like, <clears throat> This was like an astrophysics class at the end base. Nobody had any idea what this thing was. No, and Mark, really what we're doing here for our listeners, I was on the outside, you were on the inside, so we're comparing notes. Yes, yeah, so we, so no, I'm, exactly. So you know what was going on on the outside, and then this is what's being told to us on the inside. So we don't know, we don't, some people knew, like for instance, a guy that I worked with, um, his name was Tony Cifarelli, and he was the what his post was King Loader, 
and he operated these three machines, which were manufactured by the, uh, the company called King, and it's what took the tape and put it inside these cassette shells. So his post was literally the King loader. That's that's what his job was. I was the person who quality control checked these pancakes of tape. And so my post was called the Pancake QC. So you have the Pancake QC and the King Loader. And we were on a night shift and, and we this guy would talk to me all the time. Well, after we had seen this video, um, I was talking to this Tony guy and he told me that he knew Dennis Ehrlich at Florida at Flag or Clearwater or something like that. And that he, I think he was a cramming officer or something like that, but he was telling me all about this guy. He's like, oh yeah, I knew that guy. And so it was the first time we'd really heard about somebody and seen somebody who had left from science, from the Sea Org. But, okay, but now we're talking about the internet. So I was, shortly after that, I moved into the film production area of Golden Era Productions. So I was shooting and on video and film and uh, we were doing that kind of stuff. So I kind of moved away from this this area but we knew there was this thing this internet thing um the world wide web and but we weren't allowed to use it no one at the base was allowed to to do any of this because there was sps on the on the world wide web and probably all the way up until the late 90s no one at the base in golden era productions at least and, and probably anywhere else except maybe in RTC had access to the World Wide Web. There were just It just did not exist. In the late 90s, I was transferred from shoot production, uh, the shoot uh, crew chief, I was transferred and I was posted as the pre-production director. And I was over the research area of the cinematography division and, and basically knew that in order to do proper research, my research crew had to be able to have access to the internet. It was just, there's just no way about it. And by this time, there was two individuals that were put in charge of the internet at the int base. Warren McShane from RTC and another gentleman by the name of Kenny Campbellman in Golden Era Production, and he was a security guard. And these two individuals were the only two individuals that had access to the internet. And when once I established that some of my crew, some of my research staff and myself, and maybe some other of my staff in, in the logistics area and sets and props and some of these different areas would need access to the internet, there was sort of a, uh, a procedure that was formulated where you would have to get special approval approved through your seniors and your division head and security. And then it would you would get a final OK from Warren McShane and RTC. And this Internet access was heavily, heavily filtered. So if we searched for something like Scientology, it would say access denied. And really, yeah, we were not, we were any Xenu, uh, OT, uh, squirrel, any of these things were all access denied, access denied, access denied. And we were briefed when we got our approval to get on the internet that if they could see everything that all, everything that we were looking at could be viewed by Kenny Campbellman or Warren McShane, they could see every keystroke Every site that we went to, they could see it. So if we tried to get on to a site that had OT materials on it, they would see it. And it would show up as an, a, a denied request on their admin logon for, for, for that user. You didn't want to accidentally even land on a page that was not okay. I remember when I was looking, we were doing some research for a video, and I was trying to find some pictures of one of these sub-tracers. Uh, that L. Ron Hubbard was on. I think it was the PC815 or I don't remember what it was, but it was a, a certain type of boat that he right. that he was on. And I was trying to find pictures of it. And in the course of trying to find pictures of it, I kept getting all these access denied sites. 
And somebody came and saw me and was like, hey, what the, what are you looking for? You know, like it was like, holy sh holy smokes, <laughs> these guys, these guys are, it's a real deal. Like they're really seeing it because there was only a handful of people that were allowed to get on the internet. Two of them were my juniors and the other one was me. So, you know, it was it, in our area. There might have been a, 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 a poke, a little spots of people in different other research departments for other divisions like the the L. Ron Hubbard uh, personal PRO with the public relations officer. Uh, I know that guy could get on the internet. So there's a handful of people throughout the entire rest of the base. But just to even get on the internet, I had to run fiber from all these different buildings all over the property so that they would reach all the way out to the castle because the castle was basically in Timbuktu compared to where the internet line came in from the base. So there was a trunk line that came into the main administrative building of Golden Air Productions, and there was no way to connect that to anywhere else on the property. So for, for months and months and months, every Saturday when we would have our renovations, um, we would run fiber from building to building on all the underground conduits and runs and all this other stuff throughout the whole property. And we finally made our way out to the castle and we had networked the entire property, which meant that we could transfer files among divisions and among different areas of the property. But then it also made it so that we, it was possible for us to get on the internet from our work, from our offices in our, in our, on our own building. Now, what about what year would that have been? I want to say that was in the 1990, 2000, because I remember we were doing a, a heavy amounts of research for events at that time and New Year's 2000 event. And it was a lot of a lot of concentration being put on doing proper research. And we were also getting files from people. Um, all over the world and photos and so on and stories to be able to put into the events. Now, one thing that was key in order for m me and my staff to get access to the internet, we would need email addresses. Now, this was a very, and a lot of these conversations that are taking place about these people being able to get on the internet, we were having meetings with David Miscavige. David Miscavige was giving us tips and directing us on how we would be able to access the internet. Really? Absolutely. I remember that I was not allowed to have an email address that had anything to do with Scientology. So my email address when I worked at Golden Era Productions was ch at clearhorizons.org. That was my email address simply because that was one of the domains that they had locked up that I could use that had nothing to do with Scientology, and it didn't mean anything. And And the only reason it was CH at Clear Horizons, because Clear Horizons, CH. So I just said, oh, make it CH at Clear Horizons. And that, that was my email address <laughs> for the longest time. And so if I wrote somebody for something or I was signing up for some website, there was no connection to Scientology through the email address. And this was very key because we didn't, he didn't want us on user groups or forums or signing up for websites and anybody to know that it was Scientology that was signing up for these things. Well, now that's very interesting. So it had to do with security. It had, yes, it had to do with our exposure on the internet. And, and how people perceived Scientology on the internet. So if we were looking up, like I literally think he thought, oh, we were looking up drugs, then somebody somewhere would be like, oh, Billy Bob at Scientology.net is really doing a lot of research on drugs. You know, <laughs> it's just like, I don't, I don't know what the thinking of was behind it besides there was to be no Scientology mention in any of our addresses or anything that we were setting up. So that's just that's just that part. Now here's another part. So this sort of became a thing where the people that were on the internet were the people that were on the internet and no one else needed to be on the internet besides those people. So you 
it wasn't a widespread thing. It was just sort of like, oh, if you need something that's on the internet, then you go to the guy who has access to the internet and he will look for that thing for you. Okay. <laughs> Cause it's so much trouble to get access to the internet. You just go to the guy and say, Hey, can you look for this? By the time I worked, by the time I was in the executive division, and I, th I think at this time I was the assistant producer, well, since I had access to the internet and I moved to a different post, I still had access to the internet. I just wasn't in the same post position. So I was getting cigarettes, you know, off of Russian cigarette sites for my boss because I could, you know, get a pack of marble, a carton of marble reds for like seven bucks from, you know, cheap, cheap or, you know, whatever it was back in, you know, the early two thousands. And I bought a motorcycle for my boss on the internet. She had some money and I had set up a, an eBay account and I bought a motorcycle and, you know, it was like, that's, it was something that I could do that no one else could do. And nobody knew how I was doing it. They just said, well, he has internet so he can do things like this. And there was, it was like the wild, wild west at the base because nobody had internet access. So nobody knew, well, I don't know, he, somehow he's on there, whatever. So, but they would just think that you were on a computer doing something beyond their skill set. Exactly. It was, just, it yeah. was just an unknown. No one knew about it, but, the reason why I was telling you this earlier thing about Warren was at a certain point there was an investigation because not only could Warren see what everyone was doing on the internet, the, the handful of people on the, on the property that could get on the internet and Kenny could see, but they could see what each other were doing on the internet. And so in addition to them, someone at OSA Int basically managed the internet filter for the base. So because Kenny wasn't really supposed to look at all the negative N theta quote unquote stuff that was on the internet, um, he sort of just managed the users. Warren could see all that stuff, but he was an RTC. So he wasn't gonna be manually inputting all the filter terms to update them based on which new people were declared or what stories were coming out. And so that was all that, basically all of the, the, the data entry work was being done at OSA, but they could see what everybody at the end base was looking at. And I think it was somebody at OSA basically spotted that there was some porn activity at the end base. Okay. Now the porn activity was Warren McShane and Kenny Campbellman. <laughs> they were the only two people that didn't have to go through the filter and they were looking at porn because their access was unfiltered. Essentially, Kenny and Warren knew that each other were doing it, but Warren basically, Kenny just had to fall on his sword and Warren got away because he's an RTC and Kenny's in gold. Anyway, so this is what I knew at the time. A few years later, now I'm selling equipment. And in order to sell the equipment, I have to get approval from the organization. So, but I'm going to sell it on eBay. And so I tell the treasury guys, well, I need to get an org credit card um, so that I can sell this stuff on eBay. So then I can go into whatever account we set up that's linked to that credit card. Well, there is a policy, which is that no staff member can have a credit card. No Scientology staff members are allowed to have credit cards unless they're in the purchasing department of the treasury division. And then it's part of their job to buy things. Otherwise, if you want to buy something, you get a PO approved and then you place, you send the PO and then they send you the thing. And then within net 30 or whatever, they pay the bill. And there's very, very, very detailed things about purchasing. And as from what I recall, I'm actually a fully hatted treasury secretary, which is, means I'm tested and examined in all of the policy, policies of L. Ron Hubbard on, on treasury within the Scientology organization. And he, he was very um, – he did not like credit. So credit cards were basically frowned upon because you're paying right. interest and all these other things. And we can't do that. We can't be in the business of, of making money for the credit card companies. It was credit cards were a very, very, very rare thing. 
unless you were a purchaser in Treasury, you didn't have a credit card. So basically, they said you can't have a credit card, so you have to just do it without a credit card. Well, you can't sell or buy on eBay without a credit card. So I had a debit card, and I used that, and that's they were like, yeah, if you can do it with your own card, then do it with your own card. You know, screw you. We're not we're not getting we're not getting involved in this. And that's essentially what got approved. And that is essentially on how this whole rigmarole gets established on all the drama with the oh you embezzled money was because it was in my personal account because i couldn't have a credit card because i wasn't in treasury but but regardless of that no let's stop there for a minute mark this goes back to we were talking before the show you said that they had all these surplus what was it 16 millimeter projectors yeah so basically Five thousand of them? Not five thousand, but no, pallets, how many? Pallets and pallets of projectors, and they were clearing out all the overstocks, which were cassettes and, you know, music singles from twenty years ago, you know, <laughs> reel-to-reel tapes. Seriously, reel-to-reel tapes, sixteen millimeter projection uh, projectors. These were Ike sixteen millimeter mag stripe sound projectors that were bought in the 70s and the 80s that were in unopened boxes, pallets of them, that they bought. They said, oh, we have 250 organizations and everyone needs two, so we're buying 500 projectors. <laughs> and of course, they installed you know, 200 of them when they bought them. And then the other amount just kind of, like I said, over the years, they kind of picked one off the pallet every once in a while. And then it got to a point where we weren't installing 16 millimeter projectors, but we still had a ton left. So they were essentially throwing those into roll-offs or dumpsters. And I said, no, 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 send those up to me. This was at the warehouse in Los Angeles. Right. Um, I said, send those up to me. I will take care of those. And that's when I got my approval to sell them on eBay because I could sell them to these these little art house, little um, projection fanatics, and they were mint condition. The boxes had never been opened. Oh, and there's a market for that. Oh, yeah. at the time, I was I couldn't sell these things. I would list it, and it would sell. It was it was insane, and I was selling them for, you know, fifteen hundred bucks a pop or whatever it was. It was, it was a lot more than throwing it into the dumpster. So essentially, sure, sure. and that's the craziest part of this whole thing is they're saying, "Oh, you sold this equipment without authorization." Yeah, the equipment that I did have authorization to, but that you were throw going to throw into the dumpster the week before. So it's 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 if you examine the facts and you you pick it apart it's the silliest stupidest thing ever which i'm glad it happened otherwise i'd probably still be there to this day so we sell all this stuff on ebay but no one else even knows what ebay is paypal what's paypal they this is you're literally talking gibberish paypal ebay uh oh my god i have no idea what this is and and oh and 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 to put a cherry on top to add insult to injury the fee, the the amount, this discrepancy in the amount that supposedly was embezzled was the eBay fees because I didn't specifically say or I didn't specifically detail out, well, if you sell something for $200, they take a, a, a chunk of that. They take a little percentage of that, and that's the fee for using our website to sell your item. Oh, I see. So the, the, the eBay commission, that's yes. about 10%. Yes, yeah, so they that's added what they, up yeah. whatever – the amount was in the account that I'd gotten in from the sales and then added up how much money there should be. And it was 250 bucks short. So they're like, okay, you embezzled 250 bucks. It's like, well, there are oh, eBay geez. fees and shipping fees and PayPal fees. And so in the end, it was just like, really? I mean, this is really lame. Okay. And, and I know what I'm doing and you guys have no idea what I'm doing because I'm, it's all gibberish to you. You don't even understand what the internet is, much less eBay, PayPal, whatever. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the internet because of the porn and the guy who's filtering the internet is the one guy who's violating the rules of the internet. So it's just this insanity, which is the internet. Now, because I was so intimately as part of how the internet worked for the property, and I technically knew every single piece of cable, uh, Ethernet, was it 10 100 speed? Was it 10 100? Was it just uh, 10 base T? Was it 100 base T? Was it fiber? Was it Ethernet? Was it, you know, I knew every single piece. 
piece of wire that connected to every single network switch and firewall and router. And so when I left, it was like, oh, my God, the guy who was the architect of this whole system, he's gone now. But he knows our entire system, which was a huge deal. Well, the person who helped me build the system was my sister, and she worked in – the communications office, which was the guys who were in charge of the internet. It's over security. So it was, it was just a very, it was a very awkward position for her to be in after I left, obviously. But at the same time, I knew, I knew who was reading the stuff that was on the internet on the outside. So now I'm gone. And now I find in 2005, I find operation Clambake. Operation Clambake was started by a gentleman by the name of Andreas. Yeah, Andreas Heldahl Lund. Okay, so he has this website called Operation Clambake. Now, right, and the, the, the URL is zenu.net. That's right, zenu.net. Yep. Now, zenu.net, when I got out, that was the site that I, from reading about Scientology stuff on the internet, that's no matter what you look for, it leads to that site. That's just how it works. If you just got out of the Sea Org, that's the site you would read. And this is in 2005. And that would be correct. That was – OCMB was a monster. I mean it still is the monster internet fortress, but 2005 was a huge year. Yeah. So, so I was seeing what everyone was writing, and then I was also seeing – what they were trying to make it so that we couldn't see. And it was all of these, what looked like ex Sea Org members and ex Scientology members, where they were trading stories or gossip about what was happening in Scientology. And the thing that I could tell was that from being on the inside, this was Scientology's kryptonite. Because they, there was no way that they could do anything about this, and that thing that they did in 1995 was one of the things they were trying to do to shut this down. But then they also had, when we were in there, we had this thing called the uh, Scient my personal Scientology homepage, and every Scientologist got this disc, and they could basically upload a profile of themselves. And all the things they liked and the charities they supported or pro public programs or whatever, and it would put this little homepage of them, which was super, super cheesy cookie cutter website. And each person would have a Scientology.org forward slash Billy Bob or whatever it was. And it was my – I can't remember what. I think it was my Scientology website. Well, yeah, there were, I, there were a couple of variations, yeah. but uh... – just to go back to what you were saying earlier, that thing they tried to do in 1995, uh, Scientology attorney Helena Carburn, on ARS, she tried to do a remove group command. She tried to nuke ARS. That's right. And that became very controversial, and the church decided it could outcreate the internet by <laughs> flooding the internet with these cookie cutter websites. Yeah, and so but, we and we were briefed on this at the Ant Base, which is basically the more sites you have then your sites go to the top of the internet and all the bad sites go to the bottom of the internet. So no one can find the bad sites. They can only find your site. So if they search for Scientology, they have to go through one million Scientologists' websites before they would get to the bad website sort of thing. And Mark, what they didn't – what the church did not tell its members who put up – the publics who put up these cookie-cutter websites yeah. – is when you put in the floppy disk or the um, you know the disk to install yes. it. Yes. It had a net nanny filter That's on right. it. That's right. So essentially, the same filter that was being used to monitor any internet access within the Scientology organizations, they wanted the members to have that same filter. So it would essentially upload. It would it would install a filter. And then it would upload the, these search terms that were off limits to them so that they wouldn't find Operation Clambake or ARS or you know whatever the, the site du jour uh, of anti-Scientology sites were that they would – Scientologists wouldn't be able to access it. It wouldn't show up in their search results. 
And I remember that the uh, early activists, someone out here, right at the time this disc went out to all public members of Scientology, got a hold of one and cracked it open and posted all the banned search terms online. Yeah. And this was scandalous. The church uh, office of special affairs was very upset that uh, the public now knew what they were trying to hide from their members. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a flap of the base too. And you know, well, well, what happened? Well, I think the person who got thrown under the bus on that one, I'm pretty sure. I mean, somebody else might have to pipe in on this one because it wasn't really. It was a public program, but I'm pretty sure it was Ronnie Miscavige. Ronnie Miscavige Jr. I'm pretty sure got thrown under the bus for that thing because he was marketing executive international. So that was under his area. And I'm pretty sure that because it got found out, he was the one who had to bite the bullet on that. And I don't think he ever, I think that was probably one of many things that Dave was pissed about. And it wasn't long before he was gone. So, and he left. Well well, I, you know, the program, uh, there's still cookie cutter websites out there. Yeah, exactly. And I'm looking at one right now. It says, welcome to my website. Hello, my name is blank. Yeah. It says I'm a Scientologist, uh, support religious tolerance. So it's basically about myself, my success in Scientology, my favorite L. Ron Hubbard quote, groups I support, favorite links. Yeah. And then there's an interesting uh, link for a free personality test. Yeah. And it's all, it keeps you within the Scientology internet, yeah. which is sort of a, a parallel, they were trying to create a parallel internet. Yeah, they were basically, and also um, propagate the internet with all these thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and supposedly millions of sites that you'd have to wade through before you hit a bad site. So, which... Obviously, we all know today is totally 100% useless. <laughs> and it would, those sites are at the very, very bottom of your search results. <laughs> well, sure, it's useless. But, but, you know, Mark, going back, let's go back to 1994. Okay. Uh, Arnie Lerma puts the OT3 materials online. Yeah. This shocks the church. Do you even know about it when you're in the Sea Org? We know that there's the, that this is sort of, I think this is sort of pre knowledge at the internet knowledge at the base. I'm pretty sure that from my position, the first time I heard about the internet was 1995 with the Dennis Ehrlich thing. Before that, we knew that there was. I th the, another thing we were briefed on was that there was some OT materials that were in a lawsuit or that were somewhere, and they had Scientologists checking them out full time so that only Scientologists could see the OT materials, and then they'd have them for the max amount of time, and then the next person that would get them was another a Scientologist who was an uh, OT6 or 7 or whatever it was, and so that no person that was not a Scientologist, no journalists could ever get to the OT levels to then e expose them to the world. And um, I think that was the only time we heard about OT materials and, um, and them being exposed. The only other thing that I remember that we, br we got briefed on, which was like the flap of the century, which is that some Scientologists or ex-Sea Org members went into an AO. I think it was in Denmark. I think it was in Copenhagen. Correct. They yeah. walked into an org pretending they were from RTC and they demanded to see their OT materials and they just gave it to them. And they just walked right out. So they were like dressed up like like Sea Org members from RTC. Yeah, now I'm going to cover that on a future episode because uh, I'm going to cover that on a future episode. My wife, Karen De La Carrier, she was on a mission. She'd been fired on a Sea Org mission to St. Hill yeah. to find out why there were several suicides. Oh, wow. And then uh, the theft of the OT materials from Copenhagen occurred. She got sent up there as part, you know, part of another mission to find out what the hell happened. Oh, okay. Now, we'll put that all together on a future show, but the talk around the, the church, wasn't it correct that anything related to upper-level materials online is all squirrel? Yeah, so that the anything that's on the internet is squirrel. There's no actual 
this is what we were told. Obviously, I know different now, but we were told that anything on the internet was just squirrel. Um, and when I left, I read from clear to OT8 in one sitting, and it all looked pretty authentic to me. So <laughs> I, I know L. Ron Hubbard's handwriting from many, many, many years of making props and other things match and make sure it looked like his handwriting. So well, now wait, I knew that it was real. <laughs> Mark, that's a really interesting detail. If you work around the man's handwriting for years, and then you see it, you go, "Yeah, that's his handwriting." Oh yeah, it was. There's no. And, and when you hear the lectures, like there's there's confidential lectures, when you hear them, well, I know what they originally sounded like before they mixed the hell out of them. So if I heard it, I would be like, "Oh yeah, that's totally him." And they would be like, "Oh no, that's an imposter. That's not really him. That's some other person." You're like, "No, that's him. That sounds like him. That's." That's uh, that sounds like the way some of those lectures were recorded. It's like it's a no-brainer. Mark, going back to 2005, Zenu.net. Obviously, uh, Office of Special Affairs is very active. Yes. What are they trying to accomplish at Zenu.net and other sites? Okay. Well, in Scientology and specifically within OSA, their key statistics are connections cut. It's an actual statistic that they have, and and a goal really? goal that they have is to cut connections between SPs and others. So even SPs to SPs, they want to cut. So if we know that Jay Swift is an SP that posts on Operation Clambake, and we know that Blown for Good is an SP that posts on Operation Clambake, if we can cut the connection between Blown for Good and Jay Swift. That's what we want. That's what, that's what we want to do. If we want, if if Jay Swift is talking to Scientologists, uh, specific Scientologists, if we can cut that communication line, that's what we want to do. So, and this is how disconnection plays into it because what happens? Um, connections are the disinfectant to the brainwashing. This is one of the key components that has to exist for the spell to the person to pop out of the bubble as if they, cause if you, if I say, Oh my God, I was thinking this, I was thinking that I was thinking X, Y, Z every time I was getting in trouble. Well, I'm not allowed to share that with anybody when I'm within Scientology. Okay. Well now I've left Scientology, but I still am not allowed to share that with anybody. Well, if I run into you and you used to work where I used to work and I, and I mentioned to you that I used to feel like this and that, and I used to feel like X, Y, Z. And you say, you know what? I felt the exact same thing. I was thinking the exact same thought. Okay, immediately, as soon as that happens, we both realized it wasn't us. It was the organization, or it was the David Miscavige, or it was Scientology, or whatever. But we know it's not us. So instead of looking internally, we realize... Oh my God. And that's when, that's what starts to wear off the brainwashing. And that's why disconnection is so important to them because they know Scientology knows that if I was able to talk to my mother and my sister freely, if I was able to talk to them tomorrow, they'd be out of Scientology by the weekend. I would tell them all of the things that I know about that they don't know about. And then they would go, that's crazy. That's nuts. That makes sense. I'm the heck out of here. But because I can't talk, because they can't talk to me, I'm not going to be able to tell them that. Okay, well, this is very key because if you have 27 million members, if I talk to my mother and my sister, whoop de doo Okay, so three people left Scientology. Oh, my God, big wow. Okay, if you have 10,000 members, and <laughs> I talk to my mother and my sister, and my sister's husband, and my mom's husband. Well, now I just got four people out. Okay. That's a huge deal when you have 10,000 because then they're going to talk to a few people and then those people are going to talk to a few people. And before you know it, we're talking about hundreds of people. Well, if you had millions and you lost hundreds, whoop de doo same thing. But if you only have thousands, this connection, these connections that are made are huge. And now this leads right back to OCMB. Operation Clambake Xenu.net was enabling all SPs to connect to each other. And it was sort of a hub for SPs. 
And I know that ARS was sort of that, but Clambake was a sophisticated, a more it was basically a refined, more sophisticated. Not only was it a place where SPs c- could connect to each other, it was also a place where just regular Scientologists could connect to SPs. And journalist c- journalists could connect to Scientologists and um, SPs, and it was also a repository for information. So it was sort of like the end-all, be-all for everything that Scientology didn't want. And when I realized this, and I, when I realized how important this was for exposing Scientology, that's when I basically said, you know what, I'm going to start posting on here. And I think it was in 2006, I started just just posting Anything and everything that somebody was talking about this person, I would write a paragraph about that person and say, oh, no, no, he's not here. He's here, and this is what he's doing, and this is what he was doing before that, and this is when he got in trouble here, and this is when David Miscavige beat him up and threw him up against the wall. And and, and then I would just go to the next topic, and somebody would be like, well, I think this, that, and the other thing. There was a lot of speculation happening on there about from little bits and pieces of data that were occurring, and then I would fill out the details on that. And then I realized, what if you could do that in real life? And we started having these things. We called them SP parties. So we would basically, anybody and everybody that we connected with, we would invite them to a party. And then we'd all be together in real life. And then we'd share other information that we knew and where this person was and where that person was. And we started building this network of of different people who had escaped and sharing these stories and that's more and more as this happened we realized that we were all thinking the exact same thing we all wanted to leave we all didn't want to be there but because we weren't going to be able to talk to our family or because we're going to be declared a suppressive person or whatever it was you know we we stayed in addition to not being allowed to just readily leave the property and now this leads to the biggest, I think, one of the biggest um, things that sort of blew this thing wide open. And what's that? Well, when Clambake was made, it was sort of like a spike in the crack that was in the chink of Scientology's armor. And when Anonymous showed up, they took that and crack and they just ripped it wide open. And the reason they did this is because Mark Headley had an identity. Jay Swift even had an identity. A lot of these people that were posting on Clambake, they were real people that used to be in Scientology that they could figure out who they were. When Anonymous came, they were nobody. We didn't know who they were. Nobody knew who they were. And they were very, very internet savvy. They knew how the internet worked. <laughs> really good. <laughs> oh yes, they were and they were they were nobody and yet they were everybody That's and they were right. nowhere, but they were everywhere. That's right. And I remember <laughs> I remember this was uh, asymmetrical internet warfare. And as we talked about before the show, the Anons were doing it for the lols. Yeah. The, the church cannot understand lols. That's right. It was basically they had created something that was covered nowhere by L. Ron Hubbard. It was covered nowhere by any church policies or procedures or and, – and somehow circumvented everything that was written about how to handle any enemies of Scientology because the first step is you need to identify the enemy. Well, you couldn't get past that first step. So it was sort of hard to blackmail them or to dig up dirt on them or do anything with them when we couldn't even figure out, you know, who these, the Scientology couldn't figure out who these guys are. And, and then to add insult to injury, they're just doing it for fun. They're not doing, there's, they're not being paid by anybody. I know Scientology likes to pretend that they are, and that was always a big joke amongst people on there. Like, hey, the checks are going to the wrong place because I haven't gotten a penny for all this work I'm doing, you know? And, and then they stepped it up, and then they started doing it in real life. So you have these kids. I think a lot of people on there, not only kids, but I think a lot of people on there, it was just a hobby. 
They weren't getting paid. They were doing it to keep themselves busy or they're doing it because they like doing it. They thought they were doing good or they thought that was wor a worthwhile activity. And now they're doing it in real life. So now you can have a game that you're, you're playing on the computer and on the weekend – we can all get together in real life and go to our local Scientology organization and play in front and dance and draw on the sidewalk with chalk and put on crazy outfits. And we're going to do, you know, it was literally like themed parties. I remember they had like a pirate theme week, you know, <laughs> protest. Oh, yeah. All the protests had things. <laughs> yeah, Mark, I remember, party. I, I it, remember it, was a, it was a big party. It was, and I remember you showed up at one of the early protests there uh, at the HGB there at Hollywood Boulevard and Ivar. Yes, the Hollywood the church, Hollywood Guarantee Building. Yeah, HGB. I remember the church erected all this scaffolding around the sidewalk to try to obstruct protests. Yes, I remember, remember that? that. I was wearing a black shirt and sunglasses. <laughs> exactly. I have, a, I have a picture from that day because yeah, I think you happened, had epilepsy on, epaulets on that. Yeah, I had on like this sea, this bony Sea Org uniform that just kind of like a Sea Org admiral or something. Yes. It was pre OT. It is great, but uh, but what struck me was how terrified the church was of kids holding signs. Oh, it was it, and, it was it was it was their kryptonite. <laughs> oh, that's an understatement. Uh, kryptonite times a billion yes and but, but what you said earlier is so incisive I, and, and i didn't know this i didn't know this mark that uh there's actually a stat called connections cut oh yeah they have when i got my dossier um from osa um from someone who had who had left it had a chart and it had my name in the middle and it had all these people that and they had all these little like little uh it was a it was a very crude drawing a word document drawing and it had lines to from me to all these people and it had these little explosions on the line where they planned to cut the lines wow and, that is and just... it detailed out their strategy on how they would cut these lines and so this essentially is what ripped this crack wide open. And once the genie was out of the bottle, that was it. it was, I really do think that once that whole thing happened, that's it. It's, it, was, it was impossible to undo that. And due to their inefficiencies in technology, they do rely heavily on out, people outside of Scientology to deal with all these things. Scientology likes to say that I'm a member of Anonymous, which I've tried to explain to them over and over again that because I have an identity, I can't be anonymous. <laughs> but besides that, when I was going to protests and when people were writing to me on the internet and calling me, I found out that there were members of anonymous or people that had claimed they were members of anonymous that were linking, leaking information because they were doing special effects, visual effects work for golden era at golden era. So they were sitting at Golden Era at a computer working inside the gold base as a professional being paid, and they were members of Anonymous. Well, that's staggering to think about. And so but, and I didn't – at the time I was questioning, well, is that true? Is it not true? But they had – information that you could only have if you were at the ant base they knew what the bathroom next to the visual effects area looked like and they were explaining in excruciating detail what was in there which you would there's no way you could explain that because it, the bathrooms next to the visual effects department are the most insane bathrooms that you'd ever been in and you would not know that unless you were there so um but so yeah, so they had they had members of Anonymous everywhere and anywhere, and I I might have I don't know if I've told you this before, but we were at a deposition in our case, and Ken I think it was Ken Moxon was deposing myself, and he kept asking me about these people whether I had talked to the certain people or I had email communications or phone communications with individuals and he kept listing these names like have you ever had uh, any contact with blotty blah and and I and every name he said I was like what I don't, I've never heard of this person it just went on and on and on and when I got done with the deposition I went home for the day 
I remembered a few of the names and I looked them up and they were members of Anonymous. So they had already doxed all these people. And they, because I was supposedly a member of this group or I was running anonymous or member of the cyber terrorist group, they assumed that I knew all these people. <laughs> I had no idea. I literally did not know one single name that they had mentioned. <laughs> and and, and it, it was just like, really? And, and then another thing was there was an individual who was doing the HD recordings. Our depositions were being recorded on camera and live streamed to David Miscavige as they were happening. So, that is like a, a spare no expense yeah, affair. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we ended up having to pay forty-four thousand dollars in fees, is because I think depositions were running about fifteen hundred to three thousand a pop with his little HD streaming video setup. Anyway, um, so that so whoever this company that does this the I think the court reporter or court recording or whatever it's called, the, uh, the person who does this, the, the company that you hire to do these recordings for depositions, have an individual there and he sets up the camera and he mics you up and you do the deposition. Well, we had done a press conference at the Center for Inquiry. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, the Steve Allen Center for Media Inquiry. Yeah. It was uh, Susan Elliott and others and put it together. Yeah. So yeah. We, we do this press conference there <laughs> and the guy who's doing the live stream is the guy who was at the deposition wow and i look i run i see him and i go aren't you the guy that was doing the deposition the other day and he's like yeah yeah after your deposition <laughs> i joined anonymous I'm here doing a live stream of the conference of the press conference <laughs> and it was just literally like are you kidding me? <laughs> so because of the court case, that there was people involved in the court case. Even one of the, I don't know the person, the person who does the, the typing on the machine, the, is it a stenographer or the? Yeah, the court stenographer. Yeah. At the end of one of our depositions, the, sten the, the whatever, the court reporter, the court stenographer, she's like, good luck. I really hope you guys win this. You know, like we were getting people involved just through the course of the lawsuit and hearing the stories uh, of what happened at, at the international headquarters. But basically, the internet is what will undo them, period. Because there's no, there's no way that they can cut those connections and people can be connected and they don't even know about it. And that's sort of it's going to take them 10 to 20 years to catch up. And by that time, it'll be too late. So, Oh, it's, it's already too late, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, and as a perfect example, they just bought a broadcast studio. Okay, <laughs> so, so this, is a great, this is a great sort of evolution of Scientology and technology. So they've bought, they've just recently purchased a broadcast studio in Los Angeles that used to be, belong to KCET, and it has studios, and I think it has a, its own broadcast tower. I don't think they bought the broadcast license or any channels that went with it. But the, certainly they have some sort of equipment there that would be able to broadcast a signal. But by the time they renovate that place and get it up to speed, no one's going to be no one's going to be watching that that sort of channel or TV. They, sh they could have just brought a digital channel or like an app that wouldn't require them having any geographical or physical location wouldn't matter. They just produce wherever they produce. And, you know, as long as you got it. As long as you got a, a MiFi, you can upload it to the internet. You don't even need a, a T1 line or, you know, you don't need any of that anymore. It's, but, but, but because they're behind, they've just now bought a TV, a, an, an over the air broadcast station, which is just like, what? So it, it just, it just pushes this point home that they're behind and they're, they're, they're incapable of deterring any sort of future connections. Whatever connections are going to happen at this point, they are very limited on their ability to cut those connections. Oh, yes, they're becoming uh, less and less connected. And Mark, by way of summarizing, 
something you said that was so uh, that I found fascinating among the many things in this interview. I'm on uh, bridgepublications.com right now. They are still st still selling uh, DVDs. Yeah, yeah. The LRH Congresses. Why? Because they probably made 50 million and they have to get rid of them. Exactly. So so look at the dilemma. They make a lot of obsolete product and they can't go to the next new technical revolution until they sell down some amount of old product. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah. They're still trying in an information, global information age, global economy, they're trying to cut connections between people. Yeah. You still have that, that rotten crowd with OSA on the internet busy every day. Yep. And I don't. I, I. That to me, that's completely pointless activity. Well, even in the in, in the in regards to this KCET studio, I mean, they run a thirty second commercial, and it is internet fodder for weeks and weeks and weeks. Can you imagine if they had a twenty four seven channel? It would literally be. It would just be a feeding frenzy. It would be a feeding frenzy. Anything that they put on there would get picked apart for – each hour would get picked apart. There would be shows created to pick them apart. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean it's even, even like the, uh, the short uh, little videos you did when you were out at Gold Base with the Danish TV crew. Yeah. That was an international story. Yeah. So Mike and those were, has... those were just a few minutes long, and I shot them on an iPhone. So imagine if you had HD video of the insanity that is Scientology just just spewing over the air twenty four seven. You it would it would be it would it would literally talk about lulls. <laughs> well, Mike Render said on his blog today. It's a grand slam breakfast of fail. Yeah, and I and I think that's a great term from uh, former church spokesman Mike Rinder. Mark, what do you see for 2015 for the Church of Scientology? Well, they've got there's so many things in the works for 2015, and I think the documentaries and the different TV shows. I think all of these things are going to cement in stone that. There, it's open season for doing programs on Scientology. I think there's been, you know, there was a few books, and then there was some magazine articles, then there's a few little TV shows here and there, and now you're starting to get TV shows in other countries, in Germany and Denmark and 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 France and Italy. And I think it's based this HBO thing and the BBC thing are are sort of going to be like, okay. This is a real this is a real deal. I think the master was a little bit of poke. How far can we go? And I think the HBO thing is the next level. And I think if if all of these things can go through unscathed, I think the floodgates are going to open because when you any journalist who's done a story on Scientology will tell you this. When you dig and find about this one story that you've got on Scientology and you dig in and you research it, when you're done, you've got 20 more stories in addition to the one you've been trying to get. And if you pursue any one of those 20 stories, you're going to come up with another 50 stories. And it just – everyone's got Scientology stories that are TV-worthy, that are entertaining, that are uh, – that are unbelievable, that are uh, captivating, that are, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're human interest stories that people want to know about and do something about. So I think this, I think this year, this is going to be a very big year for what happens and how does it go down. And I also think that this is going to open the eyes of judges and law enforcement and prosecutors and lawyers and all these people that there's, there, there are throngs of pending legal cases against Narconons, against Scientology, against, you know, all these things are happening. And I think there's some stuff that's going to come out in the HBO documentary that is going to threaten um, certain agreements and certain um, things that Scientology is kind of set up with the government. And I think that 
is going to really open up this crack and this chink in the armor. Um, it's going to be it's going to be an amazing year, I think. Mark Hadley, you paint a very intriguing picture of 2015. It'll certainly be busy at places like Mike Render's blog, Tony Ortega's Underground Bunker. I'm going to continue on with my Scientology money project, Surviving Scientology. So it is exponentiating. Absolutely. And the truth is going to come out. With us today has been Mark Headley, author of Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.